Hi, this is Shirley Shelangoski from Contra Costa Move On, and we'd like to welcome you to our session tonight in the Sustainability Week. Uh, we have a really exciting panel tonight. Uh, during Sustainability Week, there are more speakers that will be uh, on during the week, and you can see on your screen that you can uh, sign up for more workshops. Um, so please take advantage of that. Each speaker that I'm going to have tonight uh, will have 20 minutes to speak and 10 minutes Q&A. So I will time them, and if you have a question for them for the Q&A, please put that in your chat, in the chat uh, box. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, is she, she is on, right? Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. I couldn't see you. Okay. So Senator Nancy Skinner is a member of the California State Senate. She's a Democrat uh, representing California's ninth state Senate district. Uh, covers much of the East Bay, and she will speak about the history of the bill that she co-sponsored, SB 54. Uh, it's a Solid Waste Reporting, Packaging, and Plastic Food Service Act, uh, seen by a leading bill in the U.S., and I'm really anxious to hear about it. And there's also a couple other bills that she's co-sponsored, if she'd like to speak about those as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to join you on Sustainability Week. Um, we'll start with SB 54 because it's really a landmark bill. Um, I'm sure you are all aware of how much, how ubiquitous plastics are. We have serious, serious plastic pollution. Californians alone throw away about 4.5 million tons of plastics a year. And I did that by weight, but plastics are very lightweight. So if we did it by volume, it's an enormous amount by volume. And I think any of you who have participated in creek cleanups or shoreline cleanups, you see how much plastic waste that is picked up, whether it's bottle caps, uh, coffee, you know, coffee to go, the, the caps on your coffee to go, plastic bottles, um, pl plastic of every sort, all the disposable containers for our to go food. And I think during the pandemic, the situation got even worse because when the restaurants closed and we were pretty much stuck, if we were going to get food to go, you got it in plastic. And basically plastic is, while many plastics have that recycling symbol, there are very few where it is practical or useful to recycle them. And the ones that are, they, uh, the, well, let me go back to why it is not so practical or useful to recycle plastics. First, they weigh very little. So by the time they're collected, you know, well, from you. say your house and then brought to whatever no, facility, not. they then have to be source separated because most of us don't have the type of recycling where we, we source separate ourselves. So it goes to a, um, facility where they try to extract and then they have to figure out which which type of plastic I know and then that material whichever is valuable which mostly is the what they call the PET it then has to be transported to a facility about not very many in California so somewhere so in that transport you're using a lot more fossil fuels and again you have this very lightweight material high volume that you're then transporting to create a new plastic. However, by the time you've done that whole process, mm -hmm. you've really not reduced the amount of fossil fuels used. So when we think about, of course, in addition to the issue of plastic being uh, ubiquitous in the waste stream and a problem for our marine pollution, for oceans, for creeks, for all of that, for wildlife, it's also a uh, global warming polluter because it's, its manufacturer is from a oil byproduct. And additionally, if you are going to recycle it, all the amount of transport, and since we're still using that type of transport is still mostly fossil fuel based, you have a net gain of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So of course, the optimal is to avoid using plastics altogether. But that's a very hard thing to do. 
I tried very hard during the pandemic to avoid plastics and it is very, very difficult. Um, you know, but we obviously all have to do our best. So now we get to SB 54, what was its purpose? Its purpose was to address the fact that plastics are a real problem within our waste stream. And when they go into a landfill, they never decompose, they're an inert product. They might break up. And what's happening now is that many plastics have broken up so fine that each and every one of us are ingesting about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. That's what the uh, estimation is, that we, in our physical bodies, we are taking in about a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Now, if you can imagine for little babies and uh, you know children, that's a large body load. And there's never been real studies. We don't know what the health impacts of that are. So again, we go back to that reduce, reuse, recycle. The number one thing is reduce. So the number one thing would be to try to avoid using them and where, where we can't avoid, then to have those materials be reusable or at best be recyclable. So what SB 54, the title is, the Plastic Pollution Prevention and Packaging Producer Responsibility Act. And producer responsibility is when you put a responsibility on the producer of plastics to deal with the problem of plastics. Many other countries have producer responsibility. It's a new concept for the US, but it's a very um, Germany, Denmark, the Scandinavian countries, they all have producer responsibility for many, many products. Um, but what, the, what SB 54 does, it requires is, and it was signed into law, is that all of the plastic materials that the bill covers have to be either recyclable or compostable within 10 years. And producers have to source reduce by 25% within 10 years, the amount of plastic material that's coming into the market. So part of the um, way they're gonna do that is that producers of single use plastic will are required to form a producer responsibility organization, which will work on identifying how to reduce plastic pollution. And of course the purpose is so that we can give our children and grandchildren a cleaner planet so we can address the climate damaging emissions and we can minimize the plastic that gets into, uh, that affects our wildlife, our waterways, and of course us. So and the bill, it took us, when I say us, there were a number of other co-authors, but the principal co-authors were Senator Ben Allen and myself. We introduced it initially four years ago and we put it through a two year legislative cycle and we couldn't end it. We could not get it passed on the last day of the floor in that first two year cycle. We reintroduced in this year, or not this one year, meaning 22, but rather in 21. That was the beginning of a two year legislative cycle of uh, uh, 21, 22, then 22, or rather 21 and 22. And uh, the first year we, uh, we had to park it for a little while. We didn't have the votes. So we carried it on to the second year. And then we were very fortunate to have a large number of environmental organizations come together and basically um, start to collect signatures to put something on the ballot that would even be stronger potentially than SB 54. And the, then we finally got much of the industry to sit at the table and to negotiate in good faith to get the bill passed because they wanted to avoid the initiative. And of course, the, there's great things about initiatives, but the, the not so good things is very often even if it's a good law, if we pass it by initiative, if there's some tweaks that are needed or you know, some ways that it isn't working, you have to go back to the voters to fix it. So it's, there were a lot of advantages to doing SB 54 through the legislature, but it was a, a multi-year effort and a big fight. And we needed the help of the threat of a initiative on the ballot. But like I said, now it is passed and it is signed into law and I'll stop there.
and take questions. Do you want me to use the questions in the chat or would you like me, how would you like me to do it? Uh, I thought Nadine was going to introduce them. Are you still going to introduce those, Nadine, or would you like me to introduce those or Senator Skinner herself? I think you can do that, Shirley. You as the moderator, please go ahead and look into the chat. But I'm okay. also here to help. Well, I don't mind just reading them and answering them. Okay. That's, okay. Okay. So I think the first question I see is, are plastic bags collected by Safeway actually recycled? And to be honest with you, I don't know. And I think that I think it would be very legitimate um, to, uh, you know, the Albertsons is the owner of Safeway now, would be to, uh, to contact them and ask them that question. Um, there's not very much plastic bag recycling. We've managed to eliminate it from the, you know, the bag you take from home in the, from the checkout stand, but it's not eliminated from the vegetable bins yet. So, uh, of course, we all can bring our own bags. That always helps. But uh, anyway, um, now somebody asked, why are we not punishing plastic makers, food didn't, or rather the manufacturers of even the food producers that are putting their materials in plastic? Um, and it's totally right. Food didn't always come in plastic. I mean, I still, and some of this is, you, it's more expensive, but I buy my milk in bottles. I buy from Strauss Dairy. I even am able to find, I found some yogurt in bottles so I can avoid those plastics, but it's still really hard to avoid plastics. Um, and yes, and uh, as uh, one of our folks put in, it's getting harder and harder to buy food, not pre-wrapped in plastic, even produce. But for example, I every time I go to Trader Joe's, I fill out in the suggestion box. I don't. I will not buy any any produce at Trader Joe's. It's already packaged in plastic. So I always write in their little. You know, they have a suggestion box, and I always write every time I'm there. Please uh, stop wrapping your produce in plastic. I will not buy any of your produce that's pre-wrapped in plastic. And I have noticed in some, they do seem to have more bins without it now. But uh, yes. Um, so let's see, the bill takes effect starting this January, but some of the provisions will be, um, will, will come over time. So we, there, we built in time for the producer responsibility organization to start. We built in time for the California um, Department of uh, Recycling, the Resource and Recovery Department to set up some regs around the, um, the recycled content and the compostable, because we want to make sure that if somebody produces a plastic that they say is compostable, that it actually is. So the agencies are going to have to do some work on the regs, but they are, it, it was, you know, they've got to start in January and the year, the still the effective year that we made it, that by 10 years they have to have achieved these reductions and such is built into the bill. Um, okay, uh, let's see, what other question? Um, I wanted to tax plastics because it is a, one of the ways it sends a good uh, price signal, you know, so perhaps that will motivate people to use less, but it's actually best to put that price on the producer rather than on the consumer, because of course you don't wanna punish low income people but that's a very hard thing to get passed in the legislature. Unfortunately, uh, even in a very democratic state like California, there's an allergy to taxing anything, which is partly why we don't have a carbon tax and we instead do a cap and trade program. So yes, Amy Golan said that we will have state oversight through CalRecycle. Yes, that's the oversight. CalRecycle will be doing that oversight and setting up those regulations. Um, and uh, let's see, um, let's see. Ah, you can read the provisions of the bill. You can just 
through any search engine, search, say California 2022 SB 54. And what will, one of the things that will pop up is what they call the ledge, ledge digest. And that is, um, that's the uh, repository for all of the history of a piece of legislation. It will have the, con the full content of the bill. It'll show the analysis by various committees. It'll indicate when the governor signed it. All of that information is found if you do that Google and you get to the Ledge Digest or Ledge, um, or I'll Google it myself so I can tell you the exact what, what pops up. Um, and I think I got most of the question. Uh, oh, yeah. So yes, Capri, my staff put in Ledge Info, Legislature. Yes, that's where you can, she put it in the chat where you can, uh, uh, the website where you can find the whole history of the bill and the the, um, the text of the of the bill itself. Yes. Okay, Senator Skinner, did uh, I'm not sure if you answered this one or not. Maybe I missed it, but it says, um, "Does this only apply to certain industries?" And what about plastic, medical, and dental waste? Did it's not plastic, medical, and dental waste. Oh, it doesn't apply to that. No. Okay. Right. It's primarily the whole it, the whole food in you know all uh, beverages, uh, food containers, that thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, those are those are great questions and great answers. I think you did a really good job of covering all that. Does anybody have any last minute questions they'd like to ask? I think we have somebody with a hand up. I'm going to unmute Sharon Goldberg. Okay, El Ellis or Sharon. Uh, you have to unmute. Yeah, now, now we're unmuted. Um, as you might have listened, Sharon, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Nancy and Hi, Shirley. Alice. I'm wondering what kind of enforcement will there be? This whole thing of uh, a trade association somehow enforcing rules that will, by their nature, reduce the size of their Pressing them go on a physical diet, and uh, no matter how you cut it, they're going to be selling less plastic than than before. And uh, what will cause them to go along with this deal? Well, the the um, producer responsibility association that will get started. It, they, we don't expect them to uh, police themselves. That will be Cal Recycle. And um, I, I'm, apologies, but I'm blanking if we were able to include fines in the bill. I think that we were able to include that the agency had the authority to do so, but we did not specify it. Uh, if we had specified fines, I think we probably wouldn't have gotten the votes. So we try, designed it as much as possible to give a lot of authority to Cal Recycle so that as they proceed with developing all the regulations for it, they have the ability to do enforcement. Many times when we try to build in strong enforcement in a bill, we get such pushback that we have many um, members that you know, don't support. And what I found is that sometimes the agencies, when we give them a little more leeway, and Cal Recycle is very, very committed to this bill. They were our strong partner that they, that those agencies take a strong role, that they, you know, they take their jobs very seriously. And so when you have an agency like Cal Recycle that was as committed as they are to this bill, I feel pretty confident. Well, well, you know, fines just become part of the cost of doing business, as PG&E has demonstrated. Right, right. <laughs> and anyway, not to rain on your parade, you're doing good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Senator Skinner. Um, I think this pretty much concludes your time here. Okay, um, great. If anybody maybe has more questions, could we get them to your office for answers? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Capri, Capri can put her email address in the chat. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Right. That Thank you wonderful. all and have a good sustainability week. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay. Now our next speaker is Amy Golan from Planet Renew. Um, she started Planet Renew as a vehicle to help people make a difference, and she has a zero waste facility or waste refill store in Walnut Creek. She does events, workshops, and uh, she also is going to have some consulting, and she can come to your home and offer a green home audit for households and maybe business later on. So thank you so much for coming, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. I love Walnut Creek Sustainability Week. Happy that Saturday, the EcoFest at Civic Park was in person. It was great to see so many people come out and there were so many great booths with so much great information to share. Um, I feel, I, I wanted to just present briefly kind of like a little synopsis of some of the things I do in my workshops. Um, so my title was how to live sustainably and be more green. Um, kind of give you some steps to help reduce your carbon footprint. I know inherently people want to be kind to the environment, they want to be eco-friendly, and they want to be part of the solution. So that's why I've made it my mission to help people in their eco journey, provide education. Um, like Sheila mentioned, or Shirley mentioned, I have my workshops, starting consulting. I also have a zero waste store in Walnut Creek. Um, but the one thing I found over the last four years is I find people in different phases of their eco journey. And a lot of people are just coming to me saying, hey, where do I start? I'm bringing my shopping bags to the grocery store. Um, what else can I do? Um, and, and people are very varying stages. Um, so I like to just share that um, everybody can make a difference and everybody can do things to help the environment. I know I think people feel overwhelmed at times on um, what to do and where to start. Um, but some of the first things I like to do, and usually I have a PowerPoint presentation, but I didn't think I would have enough time to present it, is share a little bit what Senator Skinner said. Um, what is plastic? Why is this a big deal? Um, as she mentioned, it is a byproduct of a fossil fuel. It does not break down. Um, so we're looking really to use products that um, are either recyclable, which I'm sure Kimberly will cover how that the state of affairs are for that, um, or even better things that are biodegradable um, or completely compostable that they'll disintegrate. Um, so that has um, a lot to do with some other key concepts. One of my favorite is the circular economy. And that really is trying to get people to focus and, and especially at the young age with how we're creating our systems of how we bring things to market, where we get our resources, how we produce a product, and then what is the end use of that product? Right now, the United States, we're pretty much in a linear economy. We take our resources, we make or manufacture a product, and then we dispose of it. And a lot of that is a plastic byproduct. The circular economy says, okay, let's think about this thoughtfully. Let's start from the beginning in the inception of creating the product and look at its entire life cycle. So let's take our resources, let's create a product, let's use it, and then it, keep it back in the system where we're either repurposing it, we're recycling it, we're reusing it. But it's something that eventually at the end will be a zero waste product that won't be any byproduct or trash that we need to deal with. So I like think, people to start thinking in that way because it's kind of a new concept here in the United States, um, looking at what zero waste concept, concepts are, um, looking at the circular economy, um, trying to think, how are we going to operate? And that goes into the, the five R's. I'm sure you've heard a lot about what are the five R's. Um, Senator Skinner mentioned reducing, reusing, recycling. Um, I love the refusing and repairing. So just a little um, synopsis about each of those. The first thing everybody can do is just reduce. What can you re reduce? You can reduce your energy usage, your water usage, um, your waste. Um, you can compost, you can reduce your food, um, trash, and a lot of these things are looking at you and your lifestyle and your home. And our biggest producer of byproducts is ourselves and in our home. So that's why I think it's always a good idea to take a look at what are you doing in your house and what can we do better? And there are lots of things that we can do to make improvements, little things, little changes that have a big effect. And if we all made little changes, it would be a, a nice exponential effect. We can reuse what we have um, instead of just throwing it away. 
whether you want to pass it on, you want to donate it, you want to thrift, um, even just things in your house, you can reuse your bags, your paper um, for wrapping or storage, you can reuse um, boxes, lots of things to reuse instead of immediately taking something and just discarding it, either trying to recycle it or putting it in the trash. Um, recycling, I know that Kim's going to go over a lot about what to recycle, how to recycle. Um, I know I visited the recycling center up, was it Martinez or Antioch? And there's a great machine there called Big Blue that does all the sorting. And the bottom line after the whole presentation was your recycling needs to be clean and dry. It's the best way to get it recycled if it has any chance of being recycled. Um, another one of the R's that I love is refusing. Um, don't take the plastic straw from the store. Don't take the plastic cutlery. Um, bring your own containers instead of getting styrofoam or a plastic container from a restaurant. These are just things that we can do. And if you love your straw, you're on the go, bring your own cutlery, bring your own straw, bring your own containers. Um, going reusable is the best way. I think most people probably have a reusable water bottle. Maybe they're bringing their shopping bags to the grocery store. But anything that is reusable um, will have a lifespan and longevity instead of being a quick society. I think I read some study that um, single-use plastics, particularly the, the water bottle, I think we use it for a span of one to seven minutes, but the, the amount of energy and resources that went into manufacture it, and then it's more than likely not going to be recycled, that's going to go to trash. So getting away from immediate single use and going into reusable. Um, other great ideas to reuse um, is when you have things at home, you can donate, like I'd mentioned, you can thrift. When you go to the grocery store, we still have the produce bags. That's one of my biggest pet peeves is produce bags. Everybody bring shopping uh, uh, produce bag or any kind of reusable bag. You can buy a shopping bag, you can buy your produce bag, take them with you to the store, reuse. Or sometimes if I run into the store and I forget my produce bags, I'll just keep everything free and single and put them on the, on the, on the checkout. Um, other great ideas that you can go at home, you can go paperless. Um, I, a lot of people don't realize the effect of how much paper we use, which obviously comes from trees, which has manufacturing. Um, so these are just a lot of the ideas that I cover in some of my workshops and in my consulting. Um, but my favorite reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse is something called refilling, um, which is kind of becoming more popular now in different cities. I think every city should have a refill shop where you can refill on every product that you would get at the grocery store. So think about all the products that you buy, your shampoo, your conditioner, your lotion, detergents, um, hand soap, dish soap, stain removers, toothpaste, sunscreen, they all come in a plastic container. Um, unless you found some company that has either compostable or reusable. But if you're heading to the Whole Foods, even Safeway, Target, those are all in plastic containers. So the idea of refilling is a great way to reduce your um, plastic that you are putting into the system. So you can take any container, you can take your old palm olive dish soap or your shampoo container, whatever you have, and you go to a store, a refill store, and you can refill on a high quality organic product and just pay per ounce. So if you went and used your own container for 25 different products, and you're buying those products three to six times a year, you can ex exponentially, you're reducing your plastic consumption um, by a lot. So I think refilling is one of my favorite ways to reduce plastic in your life, in your home. Um, and another problem with plastic, as uh, we've, we've learned tonight, and I'm sure we'll keep talking about, the microparticles from plastic have leaching into our food and to our clothes from our laundry. So the less plastic that we can keep in our life, I think the healthier it will be for us because we don't want to be ingesting a credit card worth of plastic every week. Did you say per week? That's a lot. Um, and I would love to answer any questions. I don't have any fun slides tonight, but um, I love having interactive conversation where we can talk about what people are doing, ideas, any ways I can help. So I'm gonna see if anything's in the chat. 
the first thing I see, Amy, questions, where do you source your containers? Well, it depends which container. If you go to my store, my store is called Planet Renew. I have um, a great company. I think she's right in Lafayette called Eco Lunchbox. And she does stainless steel containers with silicone lids. Silicone is made from silica, which is sand. So it will break down on like plastic. I also have a couple different lines that are made from bamboo fiber. So I have a couple different combination of um, things that you can use to store food. Um, do, do, do. Question, let's see. Amy, I just, I just had a question. Uh, is there a place that you can refill alkaline water? I've had that question before. There was a place near San Jose. Um, I don't know if they're still there, but someone actually just asked me in my store a couple of weeks ago about that, um, that they'd moved from somewhere that they could go. They brought their bottles and could refill. But that is a great idea. I know that my stepmom in San Diego, she is refilling in San Diego. So that would be a great idea here. I'll write that down. And if I find something, surely I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Refill. Um, any other questions in the chat or if anyone wants to raise their hand? Let's see. And if anyone sees a question that I haven't seen in the chat, feel free to. Uh, let's see. Did you answer that one about, they said, is your store online or in person? Um, it's both. I have an online store and I can put it in the chat. And I also have a physical store off Ignacio Valley Road in Walnut Creek. And, and what's that address for everybody? I will add that right now. If you come to the store, bring your containers. We love when you re reuse something that you have at home. Um, any questions here? Anybody have any questions that want to raise their hand? Anything I can help with? Anything you'd like to know? Yes, a lot of packaging is non-recyclable. And in Walnut Creek, I'm sure everybody knows that we've passed the law that we should all be composting now. So all food waste, um, white paper byproducts, paper towels, napkins, can go all eggshells, bones can all go into the composting bin. So if people are effect if we're effectively sorting their trash at their house, um, I think the statistic is a family of four should have trash that's about this much because the rest of it would be in the composting bin and in, tr in your um, recycling. That's kind of just a good measure to see how you're doing at home with your, how you're sorting your, your byproduct, your trash or whatever is left over. And my favorite hack, I know that, we, that um, Mount Java Recycling gives out composting bins, but sometimes there's little fruit flies or little bugs. One of my favorite hacks is if you have uh, freezer space is I put my composting in the freezer on a on a shelf and then I put it out to the green bin when it's trash pickup time. I'm working too much. I don't have time to do my own composting, but that is the best fertilizer if you do have time. If you like to grow anything with your plants or fruits and vegetables and you can compost and create your own fertilizer, that is the best. Okay, and then someone asked, uh, Mariana T asked, do you sell any long skinny bags for produce like celery or uh, odd fitting items? I have a set of five that includes an extra large bag, three medium and a small. So the largest one will cover your lettuces and your celeries. The medium will cover eight to 12 apples or something of comparable size and the smallest will cover herbs or garlic or small fruits or vegetables. And they're made out of organic cotton. So I'm, I'm, I have them at my store, um, but I'm a big advocate for just bringing something reusable to the grocery store and not taking the plastic bags. I know a lot of people tell me, oh, I reuse them over and over again. 
but you're still putting your food next to plastic, which in a perfect world, we don't want to do. Um, any other okay. questions? And, and no bones, right? Say it again. Uh, um, can you put bones in, in that, uh, in the compost? Um, yeah, you can put bones in the green bin. In the green bin, okay. Yes. Um, your personal composting at home, I'm not sure about that. I knew that you can do eggshells, but I think bones have a much longer breakdown time. Okay. And I saw a question about bulk items. Um, I don't have any bulk items. It's a different category when you start offering food. Mine's just everything for the home. So I have a whole dental area. I have a feminine care area. I have a personal care cleaning. Um, I've got everything from storage containers, food storage. I've got a small pet and baby area. And um, I sell glass and aluminum containers. I have a skincare line also that's completely refillable. Uh, she's a chemist out of UCSF and she created her own facial line. She grows all the lavender and Martina. She produces it in Pleasant Hill. And I love it because it's all refills. So you can get your lotions and your toner and your sea serum and your night cream and refill. So uh, I've stayed with the body and the kit and the home for refilling. Let's see, any questions? Do, do, do. I think there's two more in the chat here. Um, let's see. Oh, someone said no meat. Uh, Monique said no meat, cheese, or cook foods mm. into the home composting. Yes. Not make up talk virtual in person. I'm not sure if that's for me. From Ellie, was that a question for me? Make up talk virtual or in person? I'm not sure if that's for me or if she wants to clarify. Uh, we, the workshops I do are virtual and in person. Um, so it depends on what kind of group and who, who's interested. Reusable bags. Yes, it is Belle Fiore is the skincare line, Ellie. Yeah, Belle Fiore skincare. Any other questions? Answers? <laughs> I just want to say I went to a, a workshop of yours that was two hours and you presented slides and a lot of different ideas and even covered different areas like, uh, you know, conservation of water. And yes. You know, I thought that was a great idea. You might want to share the, uh, some of your ideas for water saving as well. Yeah, I think the one thing that I love that's exciting, you can look at your house and there's a lot of free programs in Walnut Creek. There's Contra Costa Water does a free water audit and they'll come to your home and they'll check every outlet in your, in your backyard, your front yard, all your landscaping and in the house. Toilets are usually the biggest culprit um, so I love for people to take care of a lot of the, take advantage of a lot of these free services. Uh, PG&E will also do an energy audit of your home for free. So you can sign up online. Um, they'll look at all of your usage. You'll put, you'll input some data and then you'll have a one-on-one -on -one, um, Zoom call with a consultant who will go over all of your energy usage, the cost, and then suggestions on how to reduce your energy consumption in your home. And it's really good to just kind of dig a little deeper. We pay our bills. We know how much things cost more or less. But when you dig a little deeper and you see where you're spending, um, when you're using energy in your home, there's different times that it's more expensive, less expensive. How are you using your water? And these are just great ways to not only help the environment and reduce your consumption, but it'll also save you money when you're more mindful of how you're using the resources in your home. The checklist that we gave at the end of the workshop was a lot of these resources that are offered here, as long as, as well as resources such as thrift stores, places to donate. Um, what else did we offer? Water, energy, where to shop, places that are more sustainable. Um, Whole Foods, obviously, and a um, couple of little grocers that are less plastic. I mean, I hate when I go to the store and they put a banana in a plastic container. And then the banana, I mean, that's the most secure piece of 
fruit that you can get that has its own packaging. So I think it's just like Senator Skinner mentioned, telling Trader Joe's, I'm not going to buy anything that comes in plastic. I think it's important for all of us to know that we have a voice and to use it, whether you're writing a letter to a your, con your um, policy people or legislation, or it's a corporation, letting them know what you think and what you want done differently. I, I look at the education of we are the bottom up and we're speaking with our dollars, we're consumers. And what needs to change is from the top down, that's policy and manufacturing. Um, I love SBS 54. I think that's a fantastic step in the right direction. I mean, I would love to see more aggressive things toward plastic manufacturers, because if we just didn't produce it, then we would help to eliminate the problem. And then we'd only have to deal with what we've currently have, which is a lot. Um, I'm sure everyone has heard of or have seen the garbage patches out in the ocean. I think there's seven of them. And we're working on solutions um, to mitigate that and, and, and break it down and, and take it out of the ocean. But the amount of plastic that is circling just on what has been produced today is enough of a problem that we can all try to work on, nevertheless, producing more plastic. So I would love to see plastic production and, and, and find other solutions that are recyclable or actually recyclable, um, compostable, biodegradable. I think that's really where we need to head as a society. But that's policy, that's manufacturing, make your voices heard. What you can do every single day is you can talk with your dollars, you can buy and put your money where there are good products, good, good um, companies, good manufacturing. Um, and then look at how you use your resources in your house, your food. These are all great ways to just be mindful and, and be aware and, and change how we do things. Okay, and Amy, I think there's a question. Um, are your products all cruelty-free um, yes. for people that don't use any animal products? Okay. Yeah, and a lot of them are vegan too. I carry a, um, a brand called Bees Wraps to help wrap food. It's a saran wrap replacement. It's also a Ziploc bag replacement. You can wrap food in it, you can cover food. And they were listening to their consumers and now they have a vegan product and then their regular product, which has, it comes from bees. Um, so it's, it's nice when you have manufacturers listening to what people want and um, provide those products for, the, for, for us. <laughs> and I'm not looking if there's any other questions. So, Shirley, if you see any on the chat, just let me yeah, know. Or, um, Mariana says, are there any non-plastic labels available for reusable containers? That's a good question. Um, the only label I can think of is something that would be reusable that you would just keep it, it have to be silicone based and you would just keep erasing or, or um, rewriting. But actual like a sticker label, I think those are all still paper and plastic based. There's so many opportunities for creative, innovative and um, technical people to create the next wave of products for, for all of us. That's what we need. I know there's a lot of fun stuff in work. Um, we just need to get it all out to the public faster. <laughs> Cleaner Costa. So it looks like there's a lot of good suggestions in the chat from different people. Oh, good. So. Um, Radhika said she wrote to Trader Joe's sustainability department. Was that corporate that you wrote to? Or did you target your local store? I always suggest doing both. Go to your local store and then go to headquarters as well. Because if you get your local store on board, then they can also go back to the head office. Paper bags, energy kit. Great. Any other questions? If anybody just wants to raise their hand, that would be fine too. Yes, my workshops are free. Um, well, most of them are free. 
The two hour one was a, a small charge, but monthly I am offering workshops in my store um, on different topics. In November, for example, I'm having Belle Fiore, the, the owner, come in and talk about skincare. So we're doing lots of education. Uh, the sustainability two hour workshop has some free gifts and uh, lots of little add ons. So that one's a small charge. And then the consulting to do like a green audit is a charge. But on my, on my website, you can see all the different options, but at least once a month, there'll be a free workshop. Yes, definitely more difficult if you don't drive. Composting things. Thrifting, yeah. And for the teenage group, thrifting is definitely the new popular um, way to shop, which is kind of exciting. Instead of buying the expensive clothes that used to be more popular when a generation ago, now the I'd say the tweens to the teens are um, spending a lot more time at thrifting stores. And fun fact, there are 12 thrift stores between Walnut Creek and Pleasant Hill, including Salvation Army and, and Goodwill. So lots of great options if you can get to those stores um, and a good way to find new things to be new for you or pass on and donate. Any other questions? Um, just had a question. Okay, now you do it. You do an audit of people's homes as well, right? Not not mm -hmm. just the water companies. Uh, what do you do there? I do kind of a holistic look at the house. I'll come in and walk through the entire house. I'll do a little bit part of your water, your energy, lighting, toxins. Then I'll go room by room, kitchen, laundry room, bathroom, um, and then plastics. So it kind of breaks down into eight components, um, do an audit through your house, and then I'll come back and give you a report with suggestions in each of those areas that are broken down. So either I can help you implement them, or you can just take the report and work on items that you'd like to work on. I mean, one of the main things that we can do for our house energy-wise is LED lighting. Switching over from the regular light bulb to LED, great way to save on energy, money, and they'll last longer and more eco-friendly. So just stuff like that, breaking down what's going on in the house. And then at the end, of course, I will um, connect every connect people with all of the free services that'll go more in depth with what to do for the water. And half the people I know that I've sent there, they find a leak and then they end up saving money because they didn't know they had a leak. They thought their bill was always supposed to be $200. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think there's one last question we'll do before uh, we let you go. Um, uh, Green Lady asks, have you been to the El Cerrito Recycling Center? I have not been to the El Cerrito one. I've only been to the one, I think it was in Martinez that I went where there was the big blue. Is there something special there? Is there something we should know about at El Cerrito? Uh, let's see, uh, can Green Lady unmute? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my sister lives in EC, oh, sorry, El Cerrito. And for me, it is like a place to go. I love this place. It is amazing. Oh. And you, when you go there, it doesn't matter. Um, when you go there, it's packed. Um, you see a lot of people who live on the streets who go there because they're able to get a lot of free stuff. Um, they have this huge room with uh, where people bring all sorts of stuff that is continually being recycled. I swear to God, they accept everything there. Um, I suggest anybody who wants, um, I don't know, just to go check it out. Um, so is, it, is it more like there are things for donating and then people can come and take, yes. not just recycling and yes. composting and trash? There's like this huge, I don't know whether you wanna call it a room or a shed, but it, there is this constant give and take and back and forth, books and records, I know records, 
um, even hate track uh, tapes, which always make me laugh. So there's some artist who takes these eight track tapes and makes art out of them, you know, instead of it going into the landfill. But it is, um, I don't know. I mean, people might think it's not great, but I think it's a wonderful place to, be, to at least check out. Well, and that's a great use of a lot, all these things that you mentioned would probably otherwise go in the trash if they, if they didn't donate them. That's a great way to just keep it going for well, yes, people they, to use. They also have a lot of people. We went there just about a week ago and there were like, I don't know, half a dozen people going in there, the computer parts thing. This one guy, he's a little, you know, uh, creative and uh, he makes sculpture out of old computer parts. And um, he's probably one of those people who can, you know, make a computer out of, you know, things. It's just, I think it's fabulous, but that's just me. Well, I think that's a great way to make things go even farther than instead of them going into the trash. Cause I know when I visited that our local recycling center, people were throwing away a lot of stuff instead of passing them on or donating them. Well, there's, yeah. there's still a lot of stuff. I mean, we're one of the few places that takes foam, that whole, all the different kinds of foam. Uh, oh. And uh, it's a huge place. It's very well run. Uh, it's very clean for what they do. Um, and it's, I check it out. So El Cerrito Recycling? Mm-hmm. I forget what streets it on, but it's in El Cerrito. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think our time is up for Amy. She gave a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate you coming here tonight and sharing all of your wisdom. And it sounds like you have a lot to offer everybody. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, we'll go on to our third speaker of the night, Kimberly Lamb. Uh, she is a uh, municipal manager at Republic Services and she's worked there for almost 10 years. She coordinates the collection programs for cities in Contra Costa and leads a team of eight recycling coordinators who assist businesses and residents with recycling and composting. Um, and she's gonna be sharing her insights and she has some slides as well. Great. Okay, welcome. welcome. Thank you so much. I am excited to be here. Um, it's fitting that I am the last speaker uh, because I am with Republic Services, the garbage recycling and composting company and we're often kind of the last thought um, for people after they've purchased something, used it, and then need to figure out where it goes. So um, excited to be here. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see here. Is that working? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's get started. One thing I want to mention is that um, this is kind of tailored towards um, residents of Walnut Creek and surrounding cities, as uh, was mentioned in the chat, different cities have different rules. And so you'll definitely want to double check, um, for example, Concord has a different company. And so they may or may not allow certain things in their carts versus other um, cities. So um, the exciting thing though, is that uh, recently there was a law passed, SB 1383, that tries to make everything more uniform for residents no matter what city you're living in. So in the next few years, we'll see um, the standardized colors for carts, which should help. And then also um, composting, uh, which right now some cities have and some cities don't. Um, in the future, every city is required to have that. So that is exciting so that everyone has the opportunity to properly recycle and properly compost. Um, and really that doesn't leave as much that would go in your landfill or trash cart. As Amy mentioned, you know, if you're doing everything properly, you really can just have maybe a small bag of trash. A lot of cities will charge um, your garbage bill based on the size of your garbage. And so the more you can reduce that, um, you know, the more money you could save. So recycling is sort of the theme of today and plastics. Um, a lot of people will just do what we call wish cycling. They wish that something could be recycled or they really hope it could be recycled and they'll throw it in the recycle cart um, and leave that for us to deal with. And that's been really tricky because contamination is an issue. 
um, I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm sure. I, I'm sure most of you guys put a lot of thought into what you're putting into each cart, but a lot of people um, just don't know or don't take the time to thoughtfully make sure that the recyclables are clean enough. Um, our slogan is empty, clean, and dry. We don't want your glass pasta sauce jar if it still has pasta sauce in it. And uh, we need things to be empty and um, pretty clean. We get a lot of questions when we talk about empty, clean, and dry because of the drought. We don't want you to waste water to wash out and scrub your containers. Um, we just we need a quick rinse if it's something kind of goopy or if it is something that's just really greasy and gross and um, you know got a lot of food gunk stuck on it, um, it might just have to go in the trash. That's because our recycling is single stream in most of our cities. That means that your clean office paper and your newspaper goes in the same recycle container as your bottles and your cans. And so if you do have pasta sauce or peanut butter, um, that can spill and get onto the clean paper and then the paper is no longer recyclable. So that's why it's really important to keep the recyclables pretty clean um, because we want to make sure that the end product is usable. So in Walnut Creek and a couple of the surrounding cities, after we pick up the recycling from your blue cart, we bring it over to Mount Diablo Resource Recovery um, in Pittsburgh and they do tours and they've just installed some new machines, um, including infrared um, and uh, robotic sorters, but there are actually still people involved in the sorting. And that's really important to keep in mind because that's, you know, their health and safety is um, really important and we wanna make sure our recyclables are the appropriate materials. Um, you'd be surprised at what some people throw in here. And uh, we wanna do our best to keep it clean. After it's sorted by material type, it's then baled. You can see here when it comes in, again, it's usually mixed recycling. Um, and then we sort it by material type down to, for example, the plastic types. So on the bottom of plastic containers, you'll often see a chasing arrow or a triangle with the arrows and then a number inside. And the number refers to the type of plastic it is, the PETs, um, HDPE, and, and so on and so forth. Some plastics are more recyclable or easier to recycle than others. Generally, number one and two uh, containers are easier to recycle than say a number six or seven um, plastic container. Someone mentioned um, compostable plastics in the chat or um, just labeling in general, um, which can be very confusing. We're seeing a lot of companies that are trying to market their items as green and sustainable because more people are interested in that, but we have to be careful about what labels they're using. There are a lot of things that are not necessarily regulated. So you could put the word biodegradable on pretty much anything because yes, eventually that thing will probably break down. It just might take 5,000 years. Um, so that word is, you know, I, I'm always skeptical when I see that. Um, BPI certified compostable carries a little bit more weight because it has to meet certain testing requirements. However, in a lot of cities, including Walnut Creek, um, we don't want compostable plastics in our compost program. The only exception are BPI certified compostable bags. If you wanna use that as a liner for your food scrap pail um, or to hold your compostable food scraps and other appropriate items. Um, but in general, the, you know, these green striped cups and other things um, we don't want and we can't accept in our compost facility. We still get them, unfortunately. Um, it is very confusing. A lot of people who purchase these items think that they're, you know, actually spending more money to make the right choice. Um, in the end, it still doesn't get composted in our facility. However, if you value the fact that it's not made from a petroleum-based, you know, a, a fossil fuel, um, then maybe for you, you still might choose to purchase this. Obviously an even better option is just reusable, you know, a glass jar or a real cup that you can use over and over and over again. Then we don't even need to worry about which container it goes into. Um, and another thing that we are working on is monitoring. Um, I'm sure again, all of you guys are probably our star sorters um, compared to just the general population. 
Um, SB 1383, that new law that I mentioned, includes route reviews, which means that we have to audit a certain uh, percentage of our routes every year and actually take a peek into everyone's containers and leave feedback. Um, and so this we're planning to do in a gentle way. Um, we don't want to make anyone um, feel totally discouraged from recycling or composting, but we wanna make sure that they are educated on what should or shouldn't be in a certain container. Currently our drivers do a little bit of this um, quality control, but there's only so much that they can see because they are just dumping the carts into the truck and they can't always tell if you know a resident has um, some stuff kind of buried in there or hidden. Um, that's tricky to identify. And uh, when I talk about recycling, I also like to talk about closing the loop. When you're buying products, please look for things that are made from recycled content materials. Um, Obviously even better is if you buy something reusable, but if you're gonna buy paper or uh, paper towels or aluminum foil, um, we wanna help create that demand for the recycled content stuff. That's what will drive recycling. And then I wanted to touch on um, kind of something new for us, um, you know, plastics, a lot of us in this zero waste field or sustainability field, we try to reduce as much plastic as we can, but the general population is still buying a lot in plastic, especially food and beverages. Um, we have a lot of brands that are now paying attention though and trying to commit to a certain percentage of post-consumer recycled content plastic in their plastic. Currently, the way that recycling works, a lot of plastics when they're recycled, they're actually downcycled. And that means that when you're recycling your plastic bottle soda, um, soda bottles, it uh, may become uh, a polyester sweater in its next life or a park bench or um, other types of products that's kind of one step down because then that park bench is really hard to recycle, but at least it's getting one more use out of it. Um, we're trying to actually create a new um, system that will make the plastic recycling a little bit more circular. So Republic Services is building a new um, type of facility. The first one will be actually in Las Vegas um, and it will take on that next step. Instead of just bailing the different types of plastic and sending them off to um, other third parties to handle, we will actually take on that process of shredding and grinding everything. Um, there's friction washing, um, sink and float, process drying so that the end product is the high quality plastic flakes that can then be used to turn into another plastic bottle so that it's not going to be downcycled but recycled. Um, you know, we know this isn't going to solve the problem because plastics still inherently have a lot of other issues, but at least this can help um, improve the recycling process, keep things domestic, and um, keep things more traceable and trackable as well. And uh, that's the end of my slides, but um, a lot of these presentations really get interesting when we get to the question and answer portion. Um, that's what I love uh, discussing. Let me stop sharing. So I would love to, let me see what questions are in the chat. Um, let's see. Are any of the plastic drink cups recyclable? Yes, if it, uh, I would look on the bottom and I've seen plastic cups that are number one and two, and those are recyclable. We are able to um, handle that type of plastic. Um, is there a commercial composter in the county? So um, currently our compostables that we collect from everyone's green cart in the Walnut Creek, Lafayette, Arinda, Moraga, Danville, um, Alamo area, we actually, send to a compost facility in Manteca, so it's pretty far. Um, we do also have a compost facility in Richmond, and that's a bit closer. It just depends on what the city and um, the company has negotiated and what they want, where they want their um, compostables to go. Um, but the compost facility churns out uh, tons and tons of finished compost, and we have compost giveaways every year so that the community can come and get the finished product of their food scraps and their yard waste that they put in the green cart for us. Another question, 
can you put in the recycle bin the compostable products? Great question. So those, the green stripe cup and the taterware fork and um, all of those compostable plastics are unfortunately also not recyclable because they're not made from um, the traditional plastic, you know, number one or two. It's it's a typically a corn based plastic. Um, those are actually not recyclable either. So unfortunately, can't go in your green bin, can't go in your blue bin. It would have to go into your garbage, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, obviously, reusable would be the best. Next question. Domino's pizza boxes, um, do they really want to be recycled? Are they okay to recycle? Yeah, so we have um, been encouraging people to put their pizza boxes in their green organics or compost cart. And then I um, recently saw an article from Domino's touting that their pizza boxes were recyclable. Um, if it is any bit oily, we want that in the compost or the green cart. Um, I have seen people where they'll actually take the time to, to tear apart their pizza box, the top or the lid might be clean and that could go in recycling, but usually the bottom is pretty oily. Um, there's some melted cheese still stuck to it and um, other things like that. We want that in the compost program. Is it correct that nothing can go in the recycling that is the size of a credit card or smaller? Also, no lids can be recycled, correct? Okay, so the size of recyclables. Um, great question. I encourage everyone to tour the recycling facility because you can see how mechanically things are sorted. And yes, things that are smaller than a credit card just literally fall through the cracks. Um, there's no good way to sort those out and create a bale of them. So the bale is that kind of cubic thing um, I showed a picture of. So small, small things are really, really hard to recycle. Um, Tetra Pak is not is typically not recyclable. Tetra Pak, for those of you who are not familiar, include um, chicken stock uh, containers, you know, those rectangular containers that sometimes um, almond milk or soy milk or things like that come in. Um, sometimes cartons are uh, also Tetra Pak. The issue with Tetra Pak for most recycl recycling companies is that it's a lot of different materials all stuck together. So you've got the paperboard, um, you know, inside, but then there's an aluminum lining and then there's a plastic coating on the outside. Plus you've got, you know, if it's a screw top um, cap or something like that, it's really hard to then have to separate all those materials out. Very labor intensive, um, resource intensive as well. So if you can try to avoid buying things in Tetra Pak, that would be best. Um, I buy oat milk, for example, and it used to just come in the half gallon cartons, which are really hard to recycle. Um, but I recently saw a couple of brands came out with jugs. And so you're getting a full gallon, um, a little less packaging, more recyclable than a Tetra Pak. And um, this question, what is the most sustainable way to deal with old or inedible cooking oil or fat? So the sanitary district or central San or whoever, where depending on where you live, um, they do not want you to pour that down the drain. That can cause a lot of issues. And especially around the holidays, we try to remind people, don't pour it down the drain. Um, you, If it's a small amount and you're gonna compost some napkins anyway, you could use the napkin and wipe that up and put that in your compost. Otherwise, um, some of the household hazardous waste facilities will actually accept it and they recycle it and turn it um, into some sort of fuel, I believe. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, our local one here is in Martinez. They actually also have a reuse room, which is great. So if you need paint, they have a lot of half full cans of paint uh, and it's fun to peruse around there. They also have different um, products that, you know, people bring trying to get rid of and um, is available for people to take if you want. Um, question, if we separated them, could the Tetra Pak parts be recycled? Um, potentially, I've actually never separated a Tetra Pak carton myself. I imagine if you peel off the plastic coating, that part would be trash because it's really like a weird filmy material. The paperboard if you are able to peel off the inside um, shiny aluminum looking part, that potentially could be recycled. Um, 
it would be a lot of work, but that's one way you could try to um, deal with that item. And someone put in the chat also a great um, resource for old cooking oil. So that's great. Um, yeah, so that's a, a little crash course in recycling and composting. Um, also, speaking of composting, backyard composting is great, as Amy mentioned. Um, some places will actually provide you a rebate on your garbage bill if you do your own backyard composting. So if you're a resident of Walnut Creek, Danville, Lafayette, Arminda Moraga, Alamo, you can get a little um, discount on your bill if you do your own backyard composting. It's a great way to keep the nutrients really local in your soil um, and your plants will love it. And um, another question, do you know how the commercially compostable food packaging is supposed to be composted? Commercially compostable food packaging. So that I think is kind of a misleading label because we send our compost to a commercial composting facility. And um, a lot of that compostable plastic is just not compostable. We've done tests where even after four to six to eight weeks, we still pull out, you know, a, a fork or a spoon. Um, it's really challenging on the actual composting side. The other challenge with compostable plastics is that it looks often just like regular plastic. So it's confusing for consumers. It's confusing for our drivers that are picking up um, carts that have things that look like just regular plastic. Um, and then of course on the back end, the actual compostability is very challenging. Um, I think I covered most of the questions in the chat, but I feel free to shout out any other questions or add some more um, in there. Um, Kimberly, I know you said you sent some of the um, stuff to Richmond and something to some things to um, Manteca. Mm -hmm. Are these biofuel um, stations too? That are they making biofuels or anything? I, I thought the one in Richmond was going to be a biofuel uh, refinery. Um, I th you may be thinking of um, the refineries that the, I th think in Martinez there were a couple of refineries that. Um, shut down and um, had new owners who were going to reopen them as biofuel refineries. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. At our compost yes. facilities, yeah, um, our end product is just the compost. And what we do with that is um, some of it goes to communities for compost giveaways, um, school garden donations, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of it goes to the agricultural sector, um, which is great because we're really closing the loop. It's, you know, your old food scraps, turning into compost to grow more food. And that's one of the reasons why we're so um, keen on keeping the compost and the recycling really clean because we're gonna be growing food in it and that's food that we're gonna eat. So we really wanna keep it just food scraps, food soiled paper. So napkins, paper towels, pizza boxes, uncoated things, and then um, yard trimmings, leaves, branches, that sort of thing. Um, let's see, do you know of any place in the Hercules Pinola Rodeo area for those of us who live in places that dump compost to take it to? Um, great question. And that's um, just throughout the county and throughout the Bay Area, there are pockets of places that don't have access to composting, whether that's, you know, having a green cart where you can put food scraps or um, it, uh, if your city hasn't rolled out composting yet. That should all be changing in the next few years. I am not aware of places right now in that specific area um, where you could drop compost off to. There actually, I heard of an app um, where people who have backyard compost bins or systems um, can post themselves as the site. And then people who don't have a yard or can't compost can then search for those people and kind of connect. Um, I actually listed myself on there and found someone nearby who lives in an apartment who can't compost. And so every two weeks she texts me and says, Hey, I'm dropping off some food scraps. And then uh, I add it to my bin. And once in a while I give her some soil. So, um, there are some creative solutions as we wait for cities to ro fully roll out composting. 
let's see, a lot of people don't seem to know that the plain paper takeout containers can go in the compost. If they have a smooth coating inside, they should go in the trash though. Yes, that um, takeout containers are very confusing because uh, a lot of them are shiny so that they don't get soggy. Um, and typically that's a plastic lining, which we don't want in the compost program. If it's fully paper, it's really easy to tear, you don't see anything shiny, then yes, that can go in the compost. And again, check with your own city because different cities have different rules. Oh yes, and Eva just shared Share Waste. I think that's the app um, that I was talking about that can connect you with people in your area to compost. Yes, it's great. Um, yes, and next door could be a good um, option. Or um, also if those of you who are on Facebook, there are Facebook Buy Nothing groups um, that are specific to each neighborhood. And that's been a great resource I have found to find things that are uh, someone doesn't need anymore and uh, something that I'm looking for and we can exchange and keep things really, really local. So that is a great option. Okay, um, peanut butter container with a little peanut butter um, and wine bottles but what about the corks and the tops? Okay, peanut butter. Um, we actually did a whole campaign that included peanut butter jars on the sides of our trucks. We, um, if you live in the Walnut Creek area, last, I think last year or two years ago, we had billboards on the side um, to really emphasize empty, clean and dry for recycling. And we showed a dog licking a peanut butter jar. Um, just a comical way to remind people, yeah, if you have peanut butter still in your jar, we don't, it, it, that's really hard to recycle. Um, peanut butter is really tough because it's so sticky. We recommend if you put a little water in the jar and screw the cap on and shake it and then dump that out, that's usually good enough. Um, otherwise, if you have a spatula or a spoon or something that you can really get most of the peanut butter out, that should be good enough. Or if you have a dog, um, you can uh, have them help you clean that jar. Wine bottles go in recycling. The corks, um, if it's a real cork, you could put it in the compost cart. Um, I believe some stores actually take back corks. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's Total Wine or a couple others, um, beverages and more might, uh, I've seen the boxes to collect the wine corks back so that they can recycle them and turn them back into corks again. Be careful though, I've seen a lot of wine corks that are now kind of a plasticky rubbery type material. And those are not compostable or recyclable. Um, and I don't think they'll take them back at those um, collection boxes. Um, you can buy peanut butter in glass jars and reuse them. Yes, you can bring your empty jars to the refill store like um, Amy's shop or other places. Hot water in jars such as peanut butter, lid on, shake, clean it out. Yes, great tip um, about the peanut butter jars. And um, I've also heard from people if they have happen to have a little space in their dishwasher, uh, you could, you know, put your peanut butter jar in there um, and get it really clean. We don't require that, um, but that's a great way to really clean your jars. And taking off wrappers is very helpful also for us. Yeah. Um, I think, let's see, I think I'm almost at time, but one thing to mention just be wary of labeling. Um, I've been seeing a lot of products that just slap that recycle triangle on them. Most recently, I think it was a Colgate or Crest toothpaste um, tube that had that symbol on it. And that's very confusing for people because they'll just throw it in their recycle cart and then we have to deal with it. Um, it's, it's really tough to figure out what's actually recyclable or not with all the new types of packaging that's coming out every day. We're as the company collecting everything, still trying to catch up. And um, often when people ask us questions about certain types of packaging, it's the first time I've seen it because I haven't you know, purchased that item before. So it's the learning process for us as well. Clean aluminum foil, yes, um, you can definitely recycle that. That's great to recycle. And um, yes, someone mentioned the please recycle me and the symbols. Sometimes they'll even put in fine print, you know, only recyclable where special facilities exist, but most people don't see that or know what that really means. Um, so that's uh, something to keep an eye out for. Obviously the best is reduce, reuse, repair, refuse. Um, 
and then you know finally recycle and compost i think that i'm at my time yes thank you so much kimberly that was excellent uh, i'd really like to thank all the speakers tonight uh, i think every one of you did an excellent job and it, this has just been wonderful i mean i think this is really great um like i said we were we're contra costa move on um i just want to give you a website in case you would like to receive a newsletter from us or volunteer, um, it's moneyoutnow at yahoo.com. And that will go to Sheila Fish, who is here. And uh, she has been our director for some time. And she's excellent. And we get involved in rallies. We get involved in educational seminars. Uh, we just do a lot of different things, uh, protests sometimes. Um, we've gone over the freeway with signs. <laughs> We've done a lot of different things. So if you're interested in getting involved with us, uh, money out now at yahoo.com. Uh, I was just starting to put it into the web or into the chat. Um, not quite finished here, but I will finish that in just a second. Um, and I'd just like to thank you again for coming out and, and remind you that if you would like to do some more of the workshops that are coming this week, please register for them. And I think all of these educational seminars for sustainability week have been fantastic. So, uh, and, and I was there at the kickoff Saturday too. It was really great to see other people coming out. And, um, you know, I would just thank you for coming and everybody have a good night.